Welcome to the NAHA webinar brought to you by the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy. To learn more about NAHA, please visit www.naha.org. Tonight's presentation topic is Using Aromas to Heal Transgenerational and Historical Trauma. This educational webinar is being presented by Kathy Skipper. Kathy is a French trained herbalist, aromatherapist, and teacher. She lives in Taos, New Mexico, and she guides healers and therapists in ways to heal their own wounds and find their personal myth in order to help others. Kathy believes for men and women to embrace the divine feminine within, women need to lead the way. She trained at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, where she studied drama, applied theater, and education. She worked in schools and social settings using drama as the media for healing. Kathy moved to rural France in her mid-20s and learned to live in the nature, traveling with a horse and cart and living off the land. In 2003, she settled in southeast of France, farming blueberries, medicinal plants, and making organic wine. At the same time, she trained at Ecole Lonnais, the largest herbal school in Europe. She went on to teach field botany, practical herbalism, gardening, and aromatherapy at the school, as well as co-authoring the book, Aromatic Medicine, with the school's director, Patrice de Bonneville. In 2014, Kathy met her husband, Dr. Florian Berkmeyer, and since then they have founded their own school called Aromanosis. Aromanosis combines aromatherapy, psychology, plant consciousness, spirituality, and personal journeying for healing the whole person. Within the context of this work, Kathy has also written a workbook created and created an online class, The Alchemy of Menopause, in which she guides women through the alchemical stages of menopause as a shamanic and empowering transformative journey. To learn more about both Kathy Skipper and her husband, Florian Berkmeyer, please visit their website at www.aromagnosis.com. And I'd like to just take a moment and welcome Kathy for being here this evening. We appreciate you spending time with us and talking about this really unique um, and interesting topic. So I'm excited for you to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. I'm really excited to be here too. Okay, so shall I begin? Yes, go for it, girl. Okay, so... Well, welcome everybody, and I'm really honored to be able to present this webinar tonight that's called Plants and Ancestors, Aromatic Shamanism for Ancestral Healing. So the reason why I really feel so honored to be able to share this work with you is because I believe not only that it's an important work and I'm passionate about it, but I actually believe that it saved my life. So we'll begin by just going through some of the points that I want to cover in this webinar. It's a very deep subject. It's a lifelong subject and there are many different aspects to it. So I've picked out some of the important ones so that I could try and give you uh, a good all round idea about this amazing and powerful healing modality. So the points that I'm uh, aiming at talking about are uh, why I believe ancestral healing is an important part of all healing modalities. So we'll look at that in detail, um, but I think it's something that all practitioners, practitioners need to be aware of and to have some sense of because it's part of what makes us whole. Secondly, I want to look at unresolved traumas that can be passed down through generations. So again, people working as practitioners and even on your own individual inner work, often we ignore the fact that trauma doesn't have to have happened in this lifetime. We can be epigenetically and in other ways, which I'll explain later, uh, channeling traumas that happened to one of our ancestors. Thirdly, the difference between intergenerational and historical trauma. These are words you'll hear and uh, being branded, branded about a lot now because this subject's getting very, um, it's becoming very important to a lot of people, but I wanted to really look at the difference between what is intergenerational trauma and what's historical trauma, even though the two do overlap. Um, obviously, we're going to be looking at the power that aroma has in this work, because it's one of the main allies that I, work, I use for ancestral work. The ancestral healing work is also very multi-layered. It works 
we work through different layers and there are different parts of us that get affected by ancestral work and that need to work together these different parts of the psyche in order to um, do the ancestral healing work in an effective way. So I want to look at these different layers and see what they are. And also, very importantly, I want to look at the mother line and our ancestral clans, especially with uh, all this talk and energy about the feminine rising in the world at the moment. I think there's a big link with our ancestral mother lines. So I want to also uh, spend a bit of time looking at that. OK, so. I think everybody would agree at the moment uh, on the planet, there's a real need to stand up and move quickly. We can't hang around anymore. And what do I, what do I mean by this? Or how do we articulate this urgent need to do something uh, when we're working in the healing arts? So I put on this slide, we're all being called to stand up and stand in our truth. And that's really how I see it. Um, I trained as a clinical aromatherapist and herbalist in a school in France. And right from the beginning, I remember when I first started seeing clients, I was always incredibly drawn to what was happening underneath the symptoms. What were the underlying emotions? What was going on for that person? And for, for, for a while, I tried to stick to what had been taught and the protocols and the symptom-based stuff, but I couldn't really pull myself away from where my my true um, vision and leaning went until in the end I started to allow myself more um, leeway and more uh, ground to to start to to look at the underlying reasons behind people's difficulties and this then as time went on this coincided with me uh, meeting Florian who and we both had a very similar way of looking at the world and looking at um, the ways people need to heal. And I'm not saying that people who um, are practitioner, practitioners that are very good at the symptom-based stuff and the physical stuff, I think that's really important. What I'm saying is we need to stand in our own truth and do what's right for us and what we're good at. Actually, that's it, is what we're good at. So finally, I allowed myself to sort of develop um, this path. And as I said, I met my husband and we went on, a, you know, our journeys in healing are very similar. So. I allowed, I felt safe and allowed the, the passion that I had for ancestral medicine and emotional and uh, spiritual healing to come through in my work. And um, I've been integrating it into classes and cons consultations. And I, what I really have to say is now I'm ready to shout it from the rooftops. It's been, the ancestral work has been going on underneath for a long time. It's part of my own journey. And as I said at the beginning, I think it's one of the reasons that I'm still here. Um, and now I'm ready to really share it because I think it's it's got its place in the world and it's got a very important place um, as a healing modality today. And I would say I've become an expert in it, in it in a way on many different levels. And what I want to do is to teach individuals, not only for their own health, but practitioners as well, who want to use this work in their practices. So yay, I'm here and this is what I want to share with you. And I want to shout about it because it's important work. Okay, so um, this work is also a gift from my ancestors, and I feel it's really important that I honor them in this presentation. So here's my grandmother and my aunt who brought me up with my mum, and you can see a reflection of me in the picture, which I think is important because the layers and the veils aren't as uh, defined as we sometimes think they are. And I'd also like to honor my ancestors by uh, telling you that I know that they've been supporting me and guiding me all my life. At first, I didn't realize it, but now where I'm, I am in the ancestral healing work, I see very much that they've always been there for me. And as a child, I sensed something without knowing it. And then as my healing intensified, I began to realize that I had to go deeply into the ancestral journey. And this really came to a head with a cancer diagnosis. So um, I had a cancer diagnosis and I thought that having a hysterectomy would be the end of the journey and everything would go back to normal. And in fact, it was the beginning of the journey. And now after a few years work, I realized that yes, um, 
cervical and uterine cancer. I had cancer of the cervix that went up into the uterus, so it's sort of in the in the passageway. Um, really does resonate with maternal ancestral work, and that's where my trauma and my wound was. So um, from there, really, I was pushed into going deeply into this work in order to find out why I had cancer and to heal the underlying emotions that were causing me this, this ill health. So I'll just tell you a little bit before we go on, because I think it's important to honor my story and my ancestors and how I got here. So um, my mother's maternal line is a mixed race background, Assamese and Anglo. And in the house, we were never allowed to mention it. My mum was born in India. And when they all came over to England, that was it. No one ever mentioned it again. And so when I was born, I knew it because I could see the different colours in my family and the different food we ate. And we didn't seem like the, the other families and the kids where I went to school. But we were never allowed to mention it. So this was this became a wound. It became something like that I, I felt I didn't have a sense of belonging. I didn't know who we were. We didn't know any of the other members of our family except for my mother and her siblings, but anybody else from other generations or even further out in the family, no one. And we never talked about it. What's interesting is what you resist persists. So the fact that this was held down actually has now become my force and my lack of sense of belonging and not being told. Now that I've worked on this ancestral work, I feel that I am so connected to my ancestors that without them, well, I can't imagine life without them. So really, I just want to welcome them here with me as we share this webinar tonight. Okay, so here we are, Florian and I, in New Mexico at the Day of the Dead. So I just want to quickly mention ancestral worship to put things into context. I think everybody, especially working in aromatherapy and plant-based medicine would agree that one of the big problems in the world today is that we've cut ourselves off from nature. And we're seeing that, I mean, everybody is aware of it now and we're seeing it in the state of affairs of the ecology and the environment. But I'd like to add to that, that we've also cut ourselves off from our ancestral worlds. And this also has huge implications, not just for individual health, but for the health and balance of family systems, communities, and global health. And did you know that ancestral worship was a part of every single culture in the world at some point in history? And not only was it a part of every single culture, culture of the world in some form, but it is the basis of all religion, of all ancient religions. So in much the same way as we suffer from our disconnection with the natural world, and we as a culture are now responsible for the degradation of the very thing that sustains us, our disconnection with the ancestral worlds has similar implications. And I think we're just beginning to realize, like we're just beginning to realize that we can't see ourselves as separate from nature or else we're not going to uh, look after it, and that's obvious now. But we're also just beginning to realize that the ancestors and their support, their guidance, the energy that leads from the ancestors to, to us is what actually sustains us as well. And we are lost without it. So, um, yes. Okay, I'm just going to take a breather and have a quick drink so I don't go too fast. I'm really happy that you're all there and um, if this is a real honor. So this slide is about the plants used in ancestral worship. And I wanted to look at these plants because there, you know, there are many plants all over the world. And obviously, they change depending on the culture and the place, because people use plants that grow where they are. But there are many plants all over the world that come up again and again in ancestral worship. And I wanted to mention them not just because they're used in ancestral worship in history, but also because these are the plants that also carry an ancestral energy because they've been used for so long um, in this type of ritualistic use of plants um, and in the world of ancestral healing. So, um, yeah, and flowers promote emotional responses in humans. They change mood. They've, they've always been used in ancestral worship, in burials, um, in rituals. And evidence has shown that uh, in burials all over the 
all over the world, plants have been used since the time of the Neanderthals. So this is nothing new. And they could be described, as I said, as ritual plants. So they, they have a sacred or religious context. And what's really nice about these plants is, uh, in, as essential oils, they're really good for ancestral work today in a different way, not in terms of ancestral worship necessarily, but in, in a work of healing. So that's why I've um, highlighted some of them. So um, which plant should we look at first? Well, let's look at the um, Tulsi. So the Tulsi, which is the sacred basil, Oximum tenuiflorium, has been used in India forever. I've got a really nice um, quote here that I'll share with you. According to Hindu religion, a dead body is placed before a Tulsi plant or the plant is carried with the corpse up to the cremation ground and planted at the funeral place in remembrance of bereaved person. The plant is never burnt by any of the Hindu tribes. So I actually started using Tulsi because uh, an Indian friend of mine um, who is an aromatherapist um, told me about how on ancestral sh shrines in India, they um, put four Tulsi incense as um, one for each lineage. And so that's how I first started using it. Now I use it as an essential and later on in the slides, we'll see how. Um, the marigold or Tagetus erecta is um, a brilliant plant for ancestral work. And I'm really excited because I've just been able to source an essential oil, which I'm waiting for it to arrive from India. Um, it's a beautiful plant because it's like um, a, a guide. So it was used a lot in Mexico, obviously, for the Day of the Dead. And it was used as a guide for the ancestors to follow the light of the plant so that they would arrive at the Day of the Dead um, easily. So it's light and, it's, and it's, its strength and beauty would lead the ancestors to uh, the party, to the festivities. And then lastly, rosemary. And rosemary is used, uh, it's like a little tree. So the evergreen trees and the this type of um, spiny plant um, is often used because it represents immortality. But for me, rosemary, I use a lot in journeys for ancestral uh, journeying because it has a lot of protective powers, but also the idea of remembrance. So I'll often pair it with another plant, but we'll look at that in a little bit. Um, I think I'm going a little bit fast and I'm getting a bit, um, you know, Florence says I'm not going so too fast, so well. So um, the, also don't forget that these plants in ancestral worship and at burial times would have been used because they had antibacterial properties. And so the plants would also um, help with any um, scent from the corpse and to keep the funeral space um, fresh with the aromatics, the resinous plants as well. So, um, and don't forget Shakespeare's uh, Hamlet, there's Rosemary and that's for remembrance. So the, these long-standing, um, how do you say it, these long-standing uses ritualistically of the plants actually empower the plants and give the plants this energy as much as the plants are also carrying it. It's a relationship between us and them that's gone on for many, many years. So. Um, that's why I choose often these plants in terms of the oils that I use because they've been used for so many thousands of years by so many people that we can take that uh, energy and work with it today in healing the ancestor in the ancestral healing work. Okay, so um, just seeing if there's anything else that I need to say about that before we go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, I just want to finish on the um, marigold. So really, as I said, I'm very excited to work with it. I had a sample of the essential oil and it's the essential oil that I'm waiting for that's going to arrive. But I feel that this flower is interesting to use for making the connection between the visible and the non-visible, the living and the ancestors. And really that's what this work is about. Well, it's many leveled and we'll see later, but one of the levels of this work is about finding ways and finding the plants and the, uh, the aromas that are gonna help us to make the link between us and the ancestral worlds. So these worlds are here and they're with us now, but we need to find ways of opening that space and uh, 
feeling it and I think this is where the plants come in and especially these plants as I said that have been used for a long time for this type of work so we'll look more at the plants and the oils in a little bit um, but we're going to go on to the next slide so okay a bit of a breather now ancestral healing and holistic health so this slide is just a collage I did but I've um, chosen it because if you see there are different semicircles you you can see the different semicircles and that's actually based on uh, a Jungian um, diagram of the psyche which Florian um, taught me and that we use a lot now in our work and the idea is that I mean everybody all of you everybody that's interested in plant medicine aromatherapy we could say you know some people say it's an alternative uh, practice other people say it's a holistic practice and the holistic word has been one that's been going around for, for, for a long time now, and from the 70s, really. But I think it's interesting to stop and say, well, OK, what is holistic health? What am I trying to do? What is the ancestral healing about in terms of holistic health? So this is a diagram that I've used as a collage, but it's a diagram of the psyche, which means, so holistic means whole. I've got um, a couple of... Um, definitions. So there's a philosophical definition of holistic, which is that it's characterized by comprehension of the parts of something as intimately interconnected and explicable only by reference to the whole. And the medicinal definition of holistic is it's characterized by the treatment of the whole person, taking into account mental and social factors rather than just the symptoms of disease. So here in the, in the diagram of the psyche, um, you can't actually see it here because I've uh, put my collage all over it, but the psyche consists of, in the middle where it says crazy and wounded, is actually the physical part of ourselves. So the physical body is part of the psyche. The next layer is the emotional body. So it's the part of us where we hold our emotions, where emotions start. Uh, the next layer where the owl is and the word guess is the mental body. So it's a little bit lighter than the emotional body and it's where our thoughts start off, where, where we, we hold our thoughts and our analyzing and our intellectual um, goings on. And then where all the words are, that's the, that's the spiritual body. And the spiritual body is again lighter than the uh, mental body and it's more expansive and it's where we touch on the soul and our spirit and the next layer which you can't really see very well here is the uh, personal collect the personal unconscious sorry which is where the shadow it's not just the shadow it's everything that we don't really need to know about ourselves for example what we had for dinner yesterday but the one of the main aspects of the personal unconscious is the shadow and that's an important part of this work in ancestral healing as well. And finally, you have the collective unconscious, which is where we're really connected to everything that ever exists and will ever exist in the world. So, I mean, that's a huge uh, thing to take in in two minutes. But what I really want to say by that is that we're looking at the whole person. So ancestral healing touches all of us. It's not just a spiritual um, journey. It's not just an emotional trauma, healing trauma. It's not just... Um, releasing cellular memory it's not just doing work ancestral worship it's also intellectual it's all those parts of ourselves um, so I think that's very important to remember but it goes beyond that as well so we can see in this slide that not only in this type of work are we looking at all parts of ourselves but we have to remember that a person is not an isolated being we belong in a family system so we are physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, we have a shadow, so we're all those things, but we're also within a system. So we belong in a family system, and then we also, within that family system, we belong in a community, and we belong in a global community, but beyond that, we also belong to an ancestral system, which is part of our family system. Our family system isn't just us and the people that are alive today. It's everybody that came before us. And I think this diagram is really beautiful. It took me quite a long time to actually get a hang on it because um, I have some spatial difficulties sometimes. But if you see the number one, that represents the person whose tree it is. This is a family tree. 
And then if you look to the left, the red dots that go from the number two up in a line like the first part of the bird's wing, that is the mother line. So your mother, your mother's mother, mother's mother's mother, and the same on the other side is the father line. And then from there, if you go from the first red dot next to the number two and go down, that's your mother's um, father. And um, yes, yeah, so that's right, that's mother's father. And then, so every time there's a gray line, there's a blood link. But also there are links between the second dot on the first line of red dots, diagonally goes down to the blue where the number four is, and they are married. So my, I mean, I can't explain it all here, but you're going to get the PDF. But this is a beautiful way of looking at the family tree and look what it gives this amazing diagram of a bird and everybody's linked. And all as each line, you see there are two people on the first line and then the next generation, there are four, next generation eight, then 16, then 32. And it very, very quickly um, goes into a lot of people. So there are a lot of ancestors behind us. And I think, you know, as much as we're going to talk about holistic healing. We need to really know and think about, well, am I working holistically? And for me, we cannot usurp the ancestors if we want to work holistically. And this diagram really shows why. Okay, so, so next one. No man can outwit the ancestors, African proverb. And I think the way I interpret this um, proverb is that the ancestors have a, a, a certain privileged vantage point and their function is to bring back and help us heal and balance the line, the line or the bloodline or the lineage. And our healthy ancestors, we'll look at what they are later, but they are wise and loving and they are in a way a link between the divine realms and the human realms they've been human but they aren't in a human body anymore and that gives them a certain knowledge and wisdom and vantage point that we can't pretend they don't exist and if we do we can't outwit them and the second uh proverb is to forget one's ancestors is to be a brook without a source a tree without a root and this is really really important for me this is what I feel and this is what I want to help other people with in the world and um, so the energy of the ancestors is what actually supports and guides us and once we connect to our healthy ancestral clans we know who we are and we know where we've come from and we regularly look after those relationships you will feel a beautiful, loving, strong, guiding energy. It's actually palpable that is behind you in life. And that's, that's the, um, the spring that feeds the stream or the, the roots that hold up the tree. And that's what I really want to help people with. In my own journey, um, that's what saved my life. That's what feeds me, nurtures me, guides me and truly parents me. Okay, so moving on. How and why I began this work? Well, I'm going to go quickly because Florence is making signs that I'm taking too long and we've got lots to get through. So how and why I began this work? Well, first, as I said, um, it, my own story. So my own story really led me to doing this work, but it, I knew before I knew what my story was, that this was important for me. It's my natural disposition, like I said before as well. I look at things from I look at the invisible. What is the invisible stuff that's happening that's making this person ill or imbalanced? It was also my diagnosis of cancer and it presented me with the need to heal. I am the wounded healer or I am a wounded healer and I think the journey of the wounded healer is to share our healing and to carry on healing ourselves in order to be there uh, and hold space for others. The ancestors are calling me, there's no doubt about it. My ancestors were, were I was cut off from them um, and it made the relationship and the connection even stronger. And they've been calling me and I'm doing the work that they need us to do. Um, we need to heal the past in order to move forward. We're in a really big 
uh, I want to say a shit place. I, I can't find the word, but you know, everybody knows what I'm talking about. The world is in a disastrous place at the moment, but we can't move forward. We can't make things better. We can't change things. And if we're carrying behind us unhealed, unaligned, unhealthy pasts. So we need to work with the ancestors in order to heal the past so that we can move forward. Okay, so off we go. The work is multi-layered. So this is just um, one of the uh, one of the um, things that I've got in my own research of, and it's burials in India actually. Um, so on one level, this work demands our mental bodies. We need to analyze, we need to research, we need to um, be organized and get information and then decide if that information is relevant or not and to move forward in order to actually look at our lineages in terms of what happened, who are my people, what was the story, and weaving these stories together. And even when we're weaving these stories together on that level, we're looking for different signs. So actually one of the signs is when there's a big gap or a space in a family tree, then you can be sure something's going on and you have to go into that space. But what I'm trying to say, on one level, we have to work intellectually with our mental bodies. On another level, at the same time, we'll be triggered as you're laying out family trees, as you're working on your ancestral lineages, you'll find that it's triggering stuff within you. It might be triggering emotions. It could be tri triggering traumas that you've been holding. It could be triggering old cellular memories that are ready to come out because you're doing the intellectual work. So the work is multi-layered and we need, we can't just work on one layer. It's spiritual as well because you'll, you'll see that in this work, we work with altars and um, having a space where we can really connect on a spiritual level to the ancestors. And all these layers are important. They need to work together and we can't have one without the other. We need them all. Okay. So a big part of the work, we'll look a little bit more, on, I think I've got a slide about the oils we use, but um, is what we call shamanic journeying. So the shamanic journeying is the part of the work that we use for connecting with the ancestors um, really powerfully and um, going it's another way of getting into that space that exists but in our day-to-day -day lives we often forget or we find it difficult to get into so some people when they meditate daily can get into a different space we use drumming we use the oils um, when people come on our teacher training we use nature we use diff we collage or, or often i use as well and then we can go into the collage in a, in a shamanic journey but the aim is always um, to find ways in to connect to our ancestors and to work through and with the memories that are coming up from ourselves that have been hidden, um, the trauma that is involved that has come through the ancestral lines. All these things can be helped, worked through with the guides and the shamanic journeying. So this is a big part of our work. It's very hard to actually explain what we do in a slide because you have to experience it, but it's a central part of our work. Okay, trauma work. Okay, so I'm just gonna have a breather again and a little drink. So trauma is often, sad to say, central to the work of ancestral healing because what hasn't been integrated and healed in the ancestral lines often will come well will always come through as an echo um in future generations not in everybody in every generation but someone somewhere along the line will be carrying it um, and this comes through in epigenetics and it also comes through the mother line the way that we're mothered through cellular memory um, and trauma is often a guide in sense and what i mean by this is that it can indicate patterns and it can indicate what is actually coming through the ancestral realms. It can give you some signs of what you need to look for when you're going backwards along the ancestral journey to see what happened, because we need to make these traumas conscious. In my own journey, for many years, I couldn't understand why I seemed to be living somebody else's life over and over again. I came from a nice middle-class background, I'd been to a private school, everything was fine, and I was living somebody's highly traumatized life. And I couldn't understand it. And, and you know, up to the age of 40, I still, I would see a therapist and I'd say, I just don't understand. I can't put my finger on why. And it wasn't until I was able to work on the ancestral 
work and unveil my own repressed um, line that I hadn't been allowed as a child to know anything about, that it became so clear. And then by making it clear, it wasn't just enough. By making it clear, I was able to at least see where the trauma came from, but then I had to work on transforming the trauma. And that's a huge part of the work we do. And it's impossible to explain here because it involves um, many layers, but we get to the point where not only are we working with the ancestors, but we're allowing them to do the healing of the trauma. And all we have to do is actually behold. But that's a, you know, I can't just, um, that's a huge part of the work that I lead people through when I'm actually working with them one-to-one um, -one or in our classes. So I'm just checking that I've said everything about that. Yeah, I think the epigenetic, epigenetic so we work a lot of this on this um, in the online class, there's a whole module about epigenetics and, you know, the, it's been seen that the impact of traumatic experiences may be epigenetically inherited by molecular memory that's passed down through generations. So I'm not a scientist. Florian in our classes explains this a lot better. I felt it. I knew it. But how it happens is through this methylation process. So um, unlike most inherited conditions, this is not caused by mutation. So the ge genetic code doesn't change. It's the process of epigenetics where the readability or the expression of genes is modified, but it doesn't change the DNA code itself. It's like tiny chemical tags are added to or removed from our DNA in response to changes in the environment in which we're living. And these tags turn genes on or off as a way of adapting to the changing conditions. And not only do these things get passed down to the next generation, but to future generations. And it's even been suggested that as this, as, if something isn't healed or integrated, not only will it be passed down to the next and then the next generation, but as the generations go further down in time, the trauma gets more intense. I think I definitely experienced that. So that's a trauma work in all aspects. Again, it touches all aspects. So um, it's a major part of the work. And you can see this, is, well, you can't know. Well, there in the in the slide, this is one of the collages that I did on my own journey, and um, it shows a lot of trauma, but it shows a lot of healing as well. And we come back to this. You can see if you the work you do when you do collage work and you come back to it, you can see uh, always more and more. It's very layered, and it's a work that will go on for a lifetime. Okay, so next ancestral work ripples outwards. Ancestral healing can help us. Okay, so ancestral healing, um, what I noticed when I was seeing clients and now um, Florian and I are, are doing consultations together is that ancestral healing has so much more effect than you can really ever imagine, not on chronic physical symptoms, you know, where people have for years been trying to find the reasons behind and the solutions for certain chronic symptoms. They've been to every doctor, any, every practitioner, and they just can't find um, the reasons. Well, often it's because they're not looking in the right place. And um, working on the ancestral lines might very well um, help someone come to the, 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 the core of what's happening to them in physical symptoms. For example, one of the things that we see a lot, and we've seen a lot uh, during the consultations recently together, is women who can't get pregnant, but there's no, there's no um, physical reason why. And often, if you work through the ancestral lines and you look what's happened in generations past, something will have happened with a child or with women in childbirth, something along those lines that's caused a trauma that hasn't been dealt with. Um, changing negative life patterns. Well, sorry, sorry about that. Um, my earplugs just got wrenched out. Okay, so changing negative life patterns, that's um, something that I have experienced and I've seen many people experience this. So for example, um, people who can never get the right job or can't find a home, they're frightened of looking for, you know, they're living in a small apartment, but they're frightened of finding a new home because they don't believe they, they're ever going to find it or um, what other negative, not feeling that they're worthy of anything. All these 
false beliefs really that create negative life patterns often are something that's not even it maybe something happened in their life that has made them have this negative belief but often the thing that happened in their life was an echo of what happened in the generation before which was an echo that happened in the generation before so it's important to really uh, not stop at our lives or at the life before but look at where the trauma started in the ancestral lines um, same with emotional patterns my emotional pattern was very much one of isolation and not being able to be intimate and not trusting people and when I unearthed my my uh, maternal bloodline it was very obvious why so that was one of the steps in it being able to heal that but I must say that healing is lifelong and I'm still working on it but um, I'm able to transform it because the ancestors are working with me too um, okay so let's go on because we've talked about trauma symptoms can, can everybody hear me because i hope these earplugs okay yes we can hear so, you okay thanks the use of aromatics and ancestral work well actually i don't think i could have done this work if it hadn't have been for the oils and that's i think one of the reasons why you know along with the sustainability issues but the power of the oils to work with these unconscious forces, to work with the ancestral worlds, to work with our traumas and emotions have been so outstanding that I don't feel I need to use them in any other way. And we only ever smell them. And we give people um, oils on a scent stick. And so um, really blending this ancestral work with the oils is for me the key to effective ancestral work so and again we looked at the way that this work this work works on different levels and we see this again with the use of oils so we need oils that are going to help and sustain us do the analytical detective work the research the going through family papers and going through the ancestry websites and trying to piece things together and looking at old old letters etc cetera, etc cetera. we need oils that are going to help us do that work we need oils that are going to help us on the emotional level to work through the trauma to work through the the emotions that have been stagnant and are now ready to come up we need oils that are going to help us work with the shadow because in the shadow is where the cellular memories that haven't been ready or ha it hasn't been safe enough for them to come up are going to come up the cellular memories that have been held there for generations so we need work oils that are going to help us with that we need work, oils that are going to help us with the shamanic journeys with the visualizations that are going to guide us that are going to lead us that are going to be allies to help us connect with the ancestors and i can tell you that the oils are there for us and you have to choose the right ones and um that's part of the work we do as well with kathy kathy zatars but um they are so powerful so um we're going to go through a few slides, I think, um, that talk ab about the work we do with the oils. So for the detective work, which is really keeping the mind going, keep keeping the uh, motivation going, because sometimes you think, I'm never going to find out. I mean, in my own story, if you had said to me today that I would know what had happened with my maternal bloodline in India, um, I would never have believed you even five years ago five years ago i knew that my great great grandmother was indian but that was it i thought i would never find out because researching in papers in india uh stuff that i nobody wanted me to know but i did and i did with the help of the oils and with the need to find out so there's this galbanum is great because it doesn't let you give up it pushes you on it gets you out of bed in the morning kind of thing and really helps you to to direct a path through what you're doing. And even when you do feel you need a rest, then when you take galbanum again, it'll it'll give you that kickstart. Because, you know, this research work is sometimes laborious and you come to dead ends. And so that's very helpful. Rosemary, Rosemarina sufficiencialis. Well, again, we've seen it for the ancestral worship. We'll see it everywhere because it's an amazing oil. Um, and here I use it for, for mental stimulation, for the mem memory um, and for helping me um, feel like I'm connecting to the ancestors on a intellectual way, looking at the dates, looking at who was linked to who. Sage um, 
is the same really peppermint it keeps me alert cedar is great for intellectual abilities mixed with intuition because you're working with the intuition at the same time cedar is really amazing for that um so let's move on okay so oils for the heart for the emotions and the trauma work so here's where we really get into the nitty-gritty with the oils and you need to know your oils intimately you'd be better off using i mean probably we use five we could use five oils and know them really really well and have a really good um toolbox for this type of work and it's better to know five oils intimately than have um hundreds of oils that you don't really know what you're doing with them so we really work deeply and intimately ourselves with the oils on our own healing journeys that's the wounded healer again before we bring them out and work with other people so we need to have journeyed with them built a relationship with them worked with them seen how they help with our own emotional um, difficulties and uh, then we feel that we we've got a relationship with them and we can work with others and this this demands intuitive wisdom this you can't get out of a book you have to work with them it demands time it demands relationship it demands respect for them as living beings um, but what you get back is so much more than book read knowledge the books are useful it, for, for other things but this is really you have to experience the oils and work with them because you know when you're when we're really working with clients and we're going deep we need to be picking oils intuitively at the right time to shift something and we need to know what we're doing so i'd rather have my toolbox of allies that i know so well and if i need something wow there bang i've got it and i can shift something for someone because i know what that oil is capable of um and some of the oils we use in this way are rose attar helichrysum sacred basil neroli these are ones that we'd use for the heart um, but there are many more on kathysattars.com you can see our go-to oils okay so um shadow work and cellular memory huge part of this work central to this work you can't do it without the shadow work and the releasing of cellular memories because they're really the cellular memories guide you um so what happens are cells hold information until it's ready to come up so um for some reason or another we there are so, certain traumas and information that we aren't ready to feel so the cells will hold it until the right moment and then with ancestral work it's obvious often because it wouldn't make sense it has to make sense and that's why this multi-layered way of working that's why we do have to work with the family tree work with the lineages work with the answer the, 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 the living ancestors the the, people, the old elders to know what happened in family lines so we get a sort of feel of the family um and then things start to unlodge and get ready to come up and they'll come up but you can't force them they'll come up at the right moment but you can help the terrain and helping the terrain one of our go-to oils the master of the shadows ones that we one that we would not ever be without is labdanum and labdanum really was my guide for months when i started to realize that um, i was going to be able to find out about my grandmother and my great-grandmother my great-great-grandmother's lives in india and it worked with me inside myself in a way sometimes i knew something inside with the help of labdanum that was digging up the cellular memories and then i'd go onto internet and suddenly something i'd been looking for for years for months would come up and there i'd have the information or it could sometimes happen the other way around I'd, some information would come up and i'd feel it and then i'd work with both my shadow and that and i'd realize yes that's it that's right i can go on from there and it was labdanum that enabled me to do this because labdanum doesn't give up it digs and digs until those those deep memories are released like little bottles sorry little bubbles of champagne i tell the students little bottles of champagne that the the, the cells open in these tiny little bottles of information rise up into our conscious realm and we have to just grab them we don't we can't do anything we can't force it but we have to be ready to grab that information when it comes up um galbanum again we saw galbanum it helps with the intellectual work with the research but it also helps with the shadow it helps us face our original strength and ancestral strength that it pushes us to manifest so somehow galbanum 
helps us to realize that we do know that we have this, this ancestral indigenous people in our line, that we come from somewhere, and there is a strength and gifts in that, and it helps us to bring that forward. Okay, so then, yeah, aromas for shamanic journeying and connecting with ancestors. So we saw the marigold or the tagetus. Don't mix up marigold, calendula. I think a lot of people in Europe use the calendula. Um, here we're talking about the tagetus, which is uh, sometimes called African marigold. And as I said, we're waiting for the essential oil to arrive, but it's really marigold helps with that connection when you want to connect and feel, because you can feel, you can actually work with, communicate, make relationship with your, with your healthy ancestors. And this is what the shamanic journeying does to help us. And marigold is one of the, sorry, it's my dog, sorry, I'm just gonna let him out. Marigold is one of the oils that really helps make that connection. Other oils that are really helpful with connecting with the ancestral realms are obviously the root medicines, the root oils. Angelica's beautiful. It's like, Angelica's like a ladder. And I actually used it just the other night. I was in a deep, dark place where some very heavy ancestral stuff was coming up to do with my inner masculine. I felt shitty, more than shitty. I felt terrified in a way as it was coming up. And I was in bed and I smelt Angelica and I asked the ancestors to... Um, to help and it's like a ladder. I could feel them there and I had the most beautiful dream and they were there and um, when I woke up, I was able to deal and move on from the difficult point. So the roots, valerian as well is great. Wild carrot is really good for ancestral journeying. We pair it sometimes with patchouli, really nice pair. Um, and obviously the plants and aromas of the places of your people. So I use a lot of Indian oils because I'm working with my maternal bloodline, which were from India. And so it really, you know, resonates. But what were the plants and the aromas of the place that your people came from? And find those plants and aromas and they'll help. You know, they say that the dead eat with their sense of smell. Well, the, 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 the ancestors react um, very powerfully and very well to smell and to plants. So find those. That's part of the journey. Okay. And then aromas for transforming the trauma. And so obviously it depends what different lines have had different traumas. Mine was very much a trauma based on um, the feminine being bought and sold kind of thing. So there's deep feminine trauma, deep trauma to do with um, feminine strength being turned against the feminine in a way. And but these oils are two that we use a lot because they're oils that know how to dig deep or somehow they have a connection with the darkness, but they know how to transform it. So Yerba Mansa on our blog, actually it's in the resources page of the aromanosis.com website. There's a, whole, um, there's a whole article about our experience with Yerba Mansa, but we use it because it grows in, it's the roots again, and it grows near the Rio Grande and the deep dark soil. It's very aromatic and it transforms, it takes you to the, you know, it allows you to touch on the deepest, darkest parts of ourselves that are traumatized and that uh, have no self-worth and transform it. Um, so it's very much a transformational plant. Palo Santo is the same, but we're actually not, I put him in here because Palo Santo, as most of you know, needs to be dead for 20 years before you get a good essential oil from it. So it's that idea of, out of that dead place comes this beautiful light, this transforming light. But actually, we're not using Palisanto anymore because sustainability issues have gone, you know, it just doesn't feel right. So unfortunately, we've got a tiny bit left for ourselves, but we're not really promoting it anymore. OK, have any of you seen this film? It's really good. It's called Coco. And I saw it not long ago um, with Florian and it's just such a beautiful film, but more than beautiful, it really does highlight the different aspects of ancestral realms and ancestral trauma. So it looks at the living dead. So this is again a huge subject. I'm gonna to touch on it in a few seconds, but if you want to know more, um, you'd have to delve deep or do one of our classes. But the living dead are, are, are the people that have died in our, lines we still know their names they died recently or uh, recently enough for us to know who they were 
um, and they're not necessarily ancestors yet. They haven't got to the ancestral realm yet because they're still working through uh, their wounds and traumas and life issues. Um, it, you don't just die and suddenly become a healthy ancestor. And the work that we do, however, with our clans and our healthy ancestors, we'll see that in a minute, enables the healthy ancestors or our indigenous people or our clan to come and bring these living dead slowly back into the ancestral clan in order to be healed. But they need, our ancestors need us to behold them to do it. Healthy ancestors are our ancient ancestors. We've we don't know their names anymore. We know maybe their, their place, where they came from, where they were indigenous to, where they were tribal. Um, and they are there to really um, love and share their wisdom and support us. They're really, for me, our true parents, the energy of the true parental energy that guides and leads us. They're the ones that we try and make contact with. And our ancestral clans is where they belong. So our ancestral clan is our indigenous group, the people who, where, because we're all indigenous to somewhere. And this is before colonization. This is before the religions took over and uh, separated us from our ancestral roots. These are our ancestral clans. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a slide to come because they're to do a lot with the maternal line. Anyway, and see the film if you can, because the film really highlights a lot of this work. Okay. Journeying with the oils, we've talked about this a lot. This is another one of the, um, what do you call it, um, collages that I did about um, my own journey. And um, I use the oils when I'm doing the collages and I uh, connect with the ancestors. So that's that. <coughs> so the oils that we use for the journeying work depends on where the client is at and what we intuitively feel is needed. So again, another reason for knowing the oils well and working with them personally before you bring them out to work with other people. We'll often use two oils together to get the guiding effect we want. Um, so you can see I've put some of the oils together that we use patchouli and rose are beautiful together. And we, I would use that really um, when there's a something feminine going on maybe we're working with the feminine bloodline there's a need for tenderness something with the mother um labdanum wild carrot we're really going hard there we're looking for shadow stuff we're we're looking to um unearth stuff that hasn't yet been brought to the consciousness angelica and galbanum same we're leading people up into the other realms and using the angelica to really like a ladder as i said to to get us further up into the realms and galvan them as a directing force. Okay, and Rosemary and Marigold, we've talked about those, but really you have to experience them yourselves. So important points. The living dead that I talked about, you shouldn't have them sitting on your knee. That was one of the problems with my own journey and um, the fact that I was living other people's trauma was that I hadn't, because I it wasn't conscious, I didn't know how to separate myself from uh, the traumatized women in my my line so we can't transform their their trauma so here we would need to work with boundaries and oils for boundaries one of the first ones that comes to mind of course is yarrow um, connection should be with the healthy wise ancestors in the ancestral clan that's the aim of the work is to actually um, connect with the healthy wise ancestors and to work with that connection and to nurture that relationship because that's the relationship of healthiness of lovingness and um they're the, they're the ancestors that are going to guide you and all this is done through shamanic journeying as we've seen so that's one of the core aspects of our work um, when you meet with your healthy ancestors you'll know it because you'll feel straight away they feel healthy wise loving and they're there for you and they're not they're, they're unconditional the love is unconditional you'll know it you'll feel it it's like putting a plug back into the electric um and we should carefully tend this relationship like a small half fire once you've connected we teach our students to tend it and to keep it going and to there are different ways of tending it but it's very important and by beholding and witnessing these ancestors, they can then heal the living dead. That's the work. That's a mistake that a lot of people make or where people get stuck. Okay, I've done my lines, I've seen where the trauma is, but how do I transform it? Well, it's not for us to transform it. It's for us to work with these healthy ancestral clans of ours and they do the transforming. Because they're that side. 
they're the side of the ancestors, we're this side, and they will bring them home to their clan. Okay, uh, next one. So very quickly, the difference between intergenerational and historical trauma, again, we work much more detail with this. Um, it's an important differentiation to make, but intergenerational trauma is what happens in your own personal line. So, you know, different stories and different ancestral lines will uh, have different effects on the generations to come. That's, in, that's intergenerational. Historical trauma often is connected, but historical trauma is when a whole people have been affected by a trauma. So it could be the Holocaust. It could be, in my own journey, um, colonization. Um, whatever it is, the, for the Native people in America, say, in colonization, um, the trauma hit, hits the whole collective. And that collective then um, gets traumatized down through the generations. So that's historical trauma. Okay, this is huge work as well, um, mother line and the mitochondrial DNA and the ancestral clan. So the mitochondrial DNA are a little bit of DNA that are in the, there's a little bit of my, DNA that are in the mitochondria that aren't in the nucleus of the cells, it's a different DNA. And it's the DNA that we've inherited from the bacteria that actually then became the mitochondria way back when we were um, one-celled um, beings. So this mitochondria is only passed down through the female line. And that's what's so interesting about it, is that um, it is virtually unchanged from generation to generation to generation to generation along the female line. Our sons have this mitochondria from us, but they don't pass it on. And this whole idea of um, matrilineality and the ancestral clan is echoes this physiology of our DNA. So in nearly all matrilineal cultures, the um, the mother line were the line where ancestry was passed down, where inheritance was passed down, where wealth was passed down, and the um, the brothers of the women were part of the women's line because they held the same mitochondrial DNA, but the fathers weren't. So um, that you'd have to look our, into, we talk about it in our classes and in the online class, but the mother line for me is a grounding. It's, it's, it's what gives us, the mother line is the most important line because it's the only part of us, of our DNA, that is unchanged, that is there like a thread, unchanged for thousands of years. So we're hot. So if you went up that thread, you took you, the resonance of that little mitochondrial DNA that's in us, and it's in your mother and your grandmother and your great grandmother and your great great grandmother that goes on and on and on like a thread. And that for me is the ground. That is the feminine holds that because feminine is matter. Matter in the sense that this is actually DNA. So it's actually part of our bodies. It's an information. It's a living information. It is the ancestral line. So the other lines are important and we need to look at them and work with them. But I believe the mother line is our clan. It's our really it's what the, it's our support system it's the thread and it's our ground so it's always i believe good to do the mother line first and then from there we can learn about the other lines but this is huge work and i'm actually working with the online class with it at the moment and um it's really interesting and i believe i just have to say um that this whole work of the feminine rising well for me the feminine is rising from this mother line the ancient tribal indigenous feminine in all of us that goes back thousands of years is rising, coming through that mother line. We're feeling her. Women are feeling her. She's archaic. She's ancient. She's part of the earth and she's part of us. That's where the feminine's rising from. It's powerful stuff. And part of the shamanic journey is connecting back with these strong indigenous women that we all have in our lines. And the oils really help with that as well. Okay, so um, let's see what's next. So there we go, our clan. That's part of my clan, the, the side with um, the taller people in it, the three actually in the front that look like they've been superimposed uh, are part of my clan. Uh, it's my mum and her sister who brought me up. Anyway, okay, and there we go, the feminine rising, Carly. So um, 
the snake goddess, I can never say her name, in the Mexican tradition uh, that is the origin of the Aztec um, roots of the Day of the Dead and Kali here. These are the goddesses that are that life, they, they know about birth and life, but they're very, very familiar with death and they know how to work with death and relate to death and dance with death. And I believe that they're really coming through us through that mitochondrial line, that golden thread of our maternal bloodline. That's where they're rising from. Okay. So yerba mansa, I talked a little bit about uh, yerba mansa as a, a powerful healing plant and we've distilled some ourselves. You can use the tincture or just the plant. I know that again, sustainability issues may be concerned here because it's a root, um, but this is like Carly. She knows the darkness. She knows the pains that the, the women went through in New Mexico for generations, but she also knows how to transform that pain. And so, you know, even with the aromas, you could smell the plant or take a little bit of root and make a little bit of of, um, of like a smell perfume from, from just putting it in alcohol or distilling a little bit in a small still, just so you've got some of the beautiful hydrosol. But yeah, these plants, Yabba Mansa is a, a very, very powerful ancestral healing plant. Okay, so I'm going to come to the end of my slides. Like this is I love. This is I've been reading a lot about the gypsies in England, and this is written by a gypsy called Patrick Jasper Lee, who, and he makes a lot of connections with our disconnection with nature and our disconnection from the ancestors. So um, I think this is very poignant for this work. He says it used to be that the world was little and the ancestors were big. Now ancestors are little and the world is big. A message that is at the heart of sickness. For without ancestors, we are less efficient and less effective as a species. And that's what I really believe. And I believe it because I've seen it with my own, my own self. And as I said at the beginning, if it wasn't for the ancestral healing, I wouldn't be here. And the reason I'm here now is to speak with the voice of my ancestors. So thank you for listening. Okay, so if you want to connect with us, um, we have an online school called aromanosis.com and uh, we have lots of different classes such as plants and ancestors, ancestral healing, the alchemy of menopause, which is about empowering women through menopause, a comprehensive guide to buying essentials that JAR um, has created, which is a very scientific and extremely necessary class. Um, we're doing live classes as well. In America, we're going to be in Bellingham, Washington, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Asheville in, in Northern Cal 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 North Carolina. Carolina, and Eureka in California. And we're just excited to be able to spend two whole days with people live working on this stuff and bringing the oils in. It's hard having a webinar without any oils to share and not being able to see everybody. Anyway, I hope I made some sense and um, thank you for listening to me. Oh, wow, Kathy, thank you so much. What an intense and enlightening and interesting webinar. I mean, I felt the ancestors come and join us, didn't you? Oh, I'm sure they were there. Yeah. I, I called mine yeah. and said, come and sit with me with this webinar. Great. And, and I, I think it, I know for me, very intriguing, opening my eyes back up to touching more into the spirituality and connecting and like that. But I'd like to thank you personally, because um, I had shared with with um, uh, Florian, uh, you know, that I had been going um, through something uh, recently and when he gave his webinar and I kind of felt a little bit alone. And so tonight I was, as I was listening to you, I thought, wait a minute, I'm not alone. I have my ancestors. So I Perfect. just sat here and I asked them to come and sit with me. So thank you for that. That's beautiful, Kelly. Yeah, this was really meant to be the synchronicity of your presentation for me personally. So I, I, I want to thank you for that. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for using that word because synchronicity is a huge part of ancestral work. <laughs> That's one of my favorite words. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, you being here and spending time with us on this really interesting topic. So thank you so much.
It's been a huge pleasure.